card and I sit on the events committee for the Northeast Ohio chapter for WIM Ohio. I'd like to take a few minutes to welcome you all today for our first panel discussion of 2021. We have a lot of exciting upcoming events for the year, so please check our website at womeninmanufacturing.org. Um, looking forward to the day when we can resume in person to events. However, until that day happens, we, we still have a lot of great events planned for the coming year. Um, we have a trivia night on uh, May 18th, um, a session on brand strategy on May 25th, and a casual coffee chat and connections on June 4th. Um, so if you're currently not a member of WIM, please contact any of the chapter members or look at our website and learn more. So with saying that, uh, just a few words regarding WIM. If this is your first event or your 10th, it's our goal to provide quality and informative programming, as well as offer a good way to network with your peers in the industry. Um, WIM encompasses manufacturers of all types and welcomes individuals from every job function from production to the C-suite. Um, membership is available to women and men working in, in, in the industry and works to empower women workers and strengthen manufacturing in the sector. We're dedicated to supporting and promoting inspiring women who have chosen careers in manufacturing. So today I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Um, Stacy Schroeder is the president and founder of Evelop LLC, a local training and consulting firm, as well as a director for the Institute of Management Studies managing Michigan, Northern Ohio, and Western Pennsylvania. She was also recently selected as a co-chair of Women in Manufacturing Ohio chapter, and we're so glad to have her on board with our, with our team. She's a dynamic, energetic workforce development professional with a passion for making things run more smoothly and efficiently. She's also a trained engineer with advanced degrees in manufacturing and operations management, logistics, supply chain, Six Sigma methodologies, as well as certification in adult training and work development. She's worked in manufacturing since 2007 with staff roles in engineering and quality leadership roles in operations and training development. She's worked in learning and development space with manufacturing for over a decade and approaches it with a systematic practical approach gained from her engineering and operations background. Please welcome Stacey Schroeder. Oh, you're going to make me blush, Jamie. Thank yeah. you for that great introduction. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our two amazing panelists for today. And just in case you're counting, we were indeed supposed to have three. Uh, Kathy, unfortunately, has contracted COVID, so we are wishing her a speedy and thorough recovery. Um, and if you happen to know her, please feel free to reach out and share your well wishes as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce our two panelists for today. The first is Jonna Green. Jonna joined DuPont as a project engineer in New Jersey. Her career with DuPont has taken her to Ohio as an engineering supervisor, Texas as a team leader, Wilmington, Delaware as a black belt and supply chain consultant, back to Ohio as an operations manager, West Virginia as an operations manager, back to Delaware as a global manufacturing consultant and business lead for the rotational program, and now plant manager of Valley View and Stowe Works. A Brooklyn, New York native, John is married and a mother of two boys who loves to travel. She's traveled to Asia and Europe so far. Is black belt certified, graduate of North Carolina A&T State University, and is pursuing her MBA from the University of Delaware. And our second panelist today is Donna Wolcott. Donna is the Director of Fill and Packaging Operations at Gojo Industries in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. She recently celebrated her 15 year anniversary at Gojo. Donna has a bachelor's degree in business management from Malone University and an associate's degree in applied science from Kent State University. Prior to joining Gojo, she served in a variety of manufacturing industries, making Longa Burger baskets, residential and commercial water softeners at Pentair Water, and shoe insoles at Remington Products. She's the mother of two and grandmother of three. Her passion projects include mentoring women in manufacturing, prison reform, and alternatives to imprisonment. Her personal interests include reading, real estate investing, and traveling. So please join me in welcoming our two panelists. And with that, we've got some questions that came from the audience. And then we're also going to be reviewing the chat for any questions that come to mind. So please feel free. Let's make this as engaging as possible. Chat in questions that you have as they occur. 
So first, let's start with how did you get into manufacturing or what led you in that direction? So Jenna, how about you first for this one? Sure, sure. Thank you, Stacy, for that intro as well. And thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to be here today. So when it came to, to manufacturing, you know, it, it wasn't top of mind in college, uh, to be honest. Um, but as I attended, you know, some of the career fairs at North Carolina a and um, and got to know where I can be uh, the most marketable in the industry, you know, it kind of pigeonholed me into to the manufacturing realm. And, you know, we all have options, right? So when I started with, with DuPont, you know, I just loved the environment. Um, I was an engineer at the time, so not, you know, too connected to, to manufacturing at the time. Um, but as I got more introduced to manufacturing, to production, to the maintenance organizations, I just, I just loved the opportunity and wanted to, to learn more. So that's how I ended up, you know, today as, as a plant manager, where, you know, you're running all of those operations and, and you know, I'm, I'm just loving it right now. So, so it's really kind of through uh, the schools that I, that I went to and, and attended and, and then, you know, just kind of being introduced from there. Great, thank you so much. And Donna, how about you? Same question. All righty, well, thank you for the warm welcome um, and introduction. So my story is very different. Um, so I guess I was aspiring to achieve the American dream <laughs> back in the day. Um, and at that time, you know, they used to call these factory jobs, you know, and if you've got a factory job and you, uh, you gave them 40 or 50 years of your life, then, you know, you could buy a nice home, you could go on vacations and support your 2.5 children or whatever that used to be. <laughs> so um, I come from a family of mostly farmers with a few teachers sprinkled in there. And certainly farming was a lot more than a 40 hour a week job. Uh, and then it was seasonal, so there was no income, you know, on the off season. Uh, we didn't live in nice homes. We did not take vacations. So I thought, that's it. That's the American dream. That's where I'm headed. Um, and even though I'm like the last year of the baby boomers, I've always identified more with the Gen Xers, I think. So, you know, I wanted to bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan and never, never let you forget you're a man. You know, <laughs> that's kind of what it was uh, back then. Um, I took my inspiration from my mother and my aunt, my great aunt. They were kind of rebels. Uh, my mom, well, let's start with my aunt. She worked for Abbott Laboratories in Columbus. Uh, she was a mixer back in the day, you know, so she was dumping the raw chemicals into a tank uh, to make uh, baby formula Similac. So she, she was the only female mixer there all the way up till the time she retired. So that was my grandmother's sister. And then my mom worked for Asplen Basket uh, in Hartville that in the uh, early 80s got bought out by Longaberger Baskets. She was initially making, uh, when she worked for Asplen, she was making baskets for the farmers. Uh, and then when, of course, when Longaberger took over, then that was uh, about the decorative, you know, type of baskets. So um, that's kind of how I got started. And uh, I've done a variety of things since then, but, you know, have kind of grown up in the, in the business and that's that's where I'm at. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, you two inspire me when I think about my own background. You know, I grew up um, with Mr. Mom and I learned to tinker with cars with him. And we did all the home projects and landscaping projects. And, and I remember when I was finishing up my engineering degree, I actually stapled pictures from a car I had rebuilt to the back of my resume because otherwise it was like, why does this girl want to get into manufacturing? But once I got in, boy, I feel like the sky's the limit. Every time you raise your hand for an opportunity to learn something, it will come to you. So uh, curiosity and ambition are well rewarded, I find. So thank you guys for that one. So, so here comes kind of the, the thorny one, you know, that I think we're all interested in hearing the answer to. So what are some of the unique obstacles that you faced as a female in a still predominantly male industry? So John, I'll let you start with that one. Oh yeah. Um, so for me, it's really not necessarily um, the pushback from, from the males in the industry. 
Uh, to be honest, it, it's the pushback from the females in the in the industry. And so I'll I'll tell you one story that that I experienced was, um, you know, coming through. You know, I was in the engineering roles. You know, like I said earlier, I wanted to get my feet wet in production because it seemed like that's where the action was was happening. And so I went to the VP of operations of DuPont. And I asked him, hey, you know, I'm real interested in the operations role. Um, you know, I would like to get my feet wet. You know, do we have an opportunity? Lo and behold, he did have an, an opportunity for me to get my feet wet as an operations manager. And I was successful through that assignment. And then, you know, as you described kind of my background, I went back to Wilmington. And, and when, whatever role I have, uh, whether I, I go there or, or, or go back into to that, um, that region, I'll connect with some of my colleagues, right? And, and kind of see how they're doing and kind of check in. And one of my colleagues actually shared that um, there was another one of, of our colleagues that, that we worked on a project with that shared with her that, you know, I don't, I don't think John is going to be successful, right? The org announcement came out that that was going to be the operations man manager up in Ohio. And, and she said, you know, John is not going to be successful. You know, not only is just she's a female, she's a black female. So she's not going to make it. She, she's not going to be successful in that assignment. And, you know, I just don't have any faith that, that she'll uh, make it happen. And so luckily I already went through that assignment. I was already successful. And this was information that I was hearing a, a couple of years later. Um, the, the, actually the, the colleague is no longer with the company. So, you know, I, you know what does that say about, about you know, herself? But, um, but it's, it's tough, right? It's, it's tough, it's hard when you get, you know, that sort of feedback um, kind of later on in, in your career. But I think the, the one thing that it did for me, you know, I was sad at first, I was mad, you know, I kind of went through, you know, kind of all of the emotions at one time. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I was, I was glad to hear that feedback because it, it helped me persevere. It helped me to, to not use that as a, as, a, as a crutch, right, for why I can't, you know, continue my career, you know, continue in, in those different opportunities. You know, Stacy, like you said, to raise your hand uh, when there's an opportunity that you're interested in, and and to strive and, and try to you know get those assignments that that helps stretch you as an individual. And so, you know, I think that was the the toughest uh, the form of feedback that I heard you know in in my entire career. Thank you for sharing that, and and I'm glad that you took it that way because. You're not the only person that I've heard a story like that from, unfortunately. Um, you know, I've experienced it myself working at Swage Lock. You know, my, my worst critics were, were females as well. And, you know, I think this is a time for us to realize we need to all be carrying as we climb, right? And it doesn't mean giving, you know, recognition where it's not due, but it means helping create opportunity and being there as a listening ear, a mentor, a guide for those that are, are following. So thank you for that. And Donna, how about you? Okay, so my first couple of decades, uh, I spent with Longaberger Baskets, and I guess I didn't realize that manufacturing was a male dominated industry because at Longaburger we were 80% female. Uh, most all leadership uh, was female and so was our plant manager. So I, I didn't really experience that until after uh, our plant shut down. And then um, when that happened, I moved on to Pentair Water in Chardon, Ohio. And there was a, a male plant manager there, uh, male VP over operations. And all of my peers were also gentlemen. So I was the night shift supervisor there. And um, I, there was a lot of whispering, a lot of, oh my gosh, you know, what does she know about this? And I was, I was nervous because I knew baskets. You know, I came in as a frontline worker and I had worked my way all the way up to, you know, the department manager there before I left. I didn't know anything about blow molding or fiberglass or, or any of those things. But I quickly learned that, you know, manufacturing is manufacturing. It doesn't matter what product you're making. The people are all the same. The processes are very similar. Um, you know, how you lead is certainly exactly the same. So um, the plant manager continued to support me in those early weeks. 
Uh, and then very quickly, they, they were a very data-driven organization. Uh, they were a publicly traded company. So very quickly, uh, once I got to building that team on third shift, my performance exceeded that of the other two supervisors, the day shift and the second shift supervisor who had been there for, for many years, both male. Um, so, you know, the senior group uh, appreciated what I was doing, but I think what, what really helped me to finally become widely accepted at that organization, uh, it was during a shift change. We had uh, two maintenance guys. Uh, there was a young fellow on second shift and he was, you know, very athletic, um, you know, big guy. And then my little guy on third shift, he was probably in his seventies. He had been a boxer in his young years. And so he's saying to this, this gentleman in his thirties, come on, come on, you know, I, you know, I can get, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, what is going on here? And the, uh, the larger, younger gentleman went to take a swing at him. And it was just instinct that I stepped in between them, you know, and I grabbed his wrist. And when I did that, I thought, oh, Donna, you're not supposed to ever touch an employee. What have you done? You know, it was just, I didn't realize what I was doing until it was over. I didn't know that the second shift supervisor was standing behind me and he kind of leans up and whispers in my ear. He said, you know, if you decide to ever get out of manufacturing, there is a job waiting for you as a bouncer. <laughs> and so it wasn't long before, you know, that got out and around to the whole organization. And so, um, you know, I really did not struggle with that after that. And I, I can say, you know, similar to what Jonna said, a lot of my negative experiences over the years have been with other females. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but it, it is absolutely something that we need to change. Uh, it's, it's, I was in nursing school for a while and I remember them saying, you know, um, that they eat their young in nursing. You know, the old nurses never want to see the, the young ones be successful. And I feel like it's kind of that way in manufacturing at some places, not every place. And it, it's changing so much. You know, our leadership here at Gojo has changed, you know, has gone from, you know, um, the nephew of our founder. Now it's gone to his daughter. Um, and our CEO is also a female. So I see, you know, big changes happening here as well. And Gojo really makes a point of supporting and developing all employees, but that includes their female employees as well. So uh, they, they've got a pretty good program going here. Thank you for sharing that. That's I really love how you two have really diverse experiences and you're coming at it from very different angles. Absolutely. And I feel like with, with every question, I, I feel you know compelled to, to chime in my own little examples for manufacturing. And I think for me, you know, I started my career at Owens Corning and I was a manufacturing engineer, super excited, you know, 21 years old, ready to, to change the world. And what I learned was, you know, a lot of the folks that I worked with had been in their job longer than I had been alive. Right. So they're looking at this yep. <laughs> young pup and saying like, what, you know, what are you going to bring to the table here? So what I came to realize was it's about being humble. It's about asking questions. It's about offering to help, right? It's not about telling, it's not about directing. It's about, let me learn from you. Let me shadow you. Tell me what the situation is. What are the problems that you're facing? And then when people see you making a concerted effort to help them solve problems, that unlocks the gates, right? Now you're starting to build that credibility and trust and rapport. And those are the kinds of things that, that led to me being able to raise the hand and get the opportunities, right? Sometimes faster than other people, you know, maybe with the same set of skills incoming, but not the same kind of attitude. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, the lessons that we're hearing here are look within yourself, reflect on the value that you're bringing, take the feedback, you know, think about it, reflect upon it, and then keep pushing forward in, in a positive way. So thank you too for your answers to that one. And let's see, we've got our third question is, well, this is a fun one. So what's your advice for women just starting out in manufacturing? So Jana, how about you? Oh, just starting out in manufacturing. Wow, that was like 16 years ago for me. Um, you know, really network, you know, network in and outside of, of the company. Um, a lot of you really on, on the call or, or doing the right things today by you know being involved with WIM, right? Because not only can you make great connections within the company, but also outside. 
And, and like Donna, myself, Stacy, we're sharing all of our, our opportunities, um, you know, our experiences. You know, you can learn from that and, and use that if you're ever faced with a difficult situation. Uh, what I always like to do is ask people, you know, what mistakes have you made, right? So that I don't make those same mistakes. And, and, you know, and that I've learned from others' mistakes so that, you know, I don't, I don't repeat those same actions. So I think, you know, for me, it's just really kind of network, you know, open up your network, continue to stay in contact with people uh, because you never know, you know, you may um, need their help sometime in the future. You may need some advice. Um, you may need to vent, right? You may need to, to vent to someone and why not someone outside of, of the company uh, so that you can get some ideas on how to resolve those issues. Thank you so much. And, and you're right, it does seem like it was way too long ago. <laughs> Donna, how about you? What, what advice would you give your, your younger self or these other women that are just starting out? Um, some of the things that, that Jonna said, you know, are, she's absolutely spot on. Uh, the professional organizations, you know, I've been a member of WIM for a few years now, and I happened to be at a summit in Chicago, and that's when I stumbled onto WIM. And uh, so absolutely, those things are important. I think there are so many different disciplines within manufacturing that people may not realize. You know, it's like, do you want to be a part of supply chain? Do you want to be a part of finance? Do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be in human resources? Do you want to be a frontline leader? Uh, there are so many different things, but there's two things that I always look for, you know, when I'm, when I'm hiring supervisors to work for me. Uh, and, and those things are the IT, um, the information technology or information systems side. So much of manufacturing is becoming more and more automated. Um, and, you know, we're, we're including robots in some of those things. So lines that used to take maybe 25 people to run, now they're taking four or five people to run. But the skill set that is needed now is more of that technology side of the business. But even if you have five employees or 500 employees, um, you know, that you're directly responsible for or indirectly responsible for, all of those human resources, skills, the organizational development, the understanding of how to de-escalate situations, the change management, you know, the diversity, you know, inclusion, equity, all these things were not terms that we heard 20 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, but there's just, there is so many ways you can take manufacturing. You know, you can be in sales and, you know, part of the business, you can be in the planning part. It's just anything that you wanna do, it's available within manufacturing. Uh, but I would definitely recommend, you know, get your education like Jonna did, you know, when you're young. I did not get my uh, bachelor's in business until 2008. It was after Longaberger had shut down. Uh, I had lost my job and I never wanted to be in that position again without a degree when I went to apply for a job. Um, Longaberger had a great, great training program. They had what was called Longaberger, Longaberger University. They had purchased an elementary school uh, near their corporate headquarters. And, you know, they staffed that with trainers that were internal. And when, then we brought people in from the outside, you know, Franklin Covey, uh, people like yourself, uh, Stacey, all of those things, um, you know, just so many different ways to go. But absolutely, if you're interested, go for it. I still think um, I think, you know, that American dream is a little different than it used to be. It's not getting that factory job and, and doing all those things. It's more of being entrepreneurs today or consultants or that all of those things are available within manufacturing. It's still a great place to be. It's exciting. There are new challenges every day. Um, there's never a dull moment for sure in manufacturing. Thank you, Donna. I totally agree. Never a dull moment. I think, um, you know, if I could talk to my younger self, I would say definitely have that growth mindset, be flexible, be open to trying new experiences, even if you don't think you're going to like them, because you're learning something, even if it is what not to do next time. That's a valuable lesson in and of itself. Um, and I would echo the networking 
And it's not always networking uh, one time for a specific purpose. It's maintaining those relationships over time. Um, one thing I've noticed in my time in manufacturing is the circle gets smaller and smaller and more and more interconnected. So you're always gonna run into people that you know from past companies, from organizations like WIM. So make the most of it. Everybody has unique experiences and expertise and you're gonna learn something from every conversation. So we've got a lot of good questions that have come in. So apologize if it looks like I'm looking away. I'm just pulling up the Word document where I've been saving them all. So let me start at the top here. So the first one, ooh, this is a doozy. What are your tips for getting my job done with people who are full of conflict and don't want me to succeed? I'll leave that open, whoever feels compelled. Yeah, um, and, and so without knowing kind of some of the, the details, right, of, of that question, kind of taking it at, at face value um, with, with moving to, to different sites, um, you know, having kind of those town halls, uh, which we're not allowed to have right now, but, you know, there's at least one in, in that group that just wants to challenge you, right? Um, we'll ask kind of off the wall, wall questions and speak for the whole organization. And, you know, after I learn who that person is or, you know, the critical few people are, I, I make it a point to always connect with them before a group setting um, or a group project you know, someone that's, that's really vocal and, and bring up those topics at, at hand ahead of time with them. And, and that way I can get a heads up or a head start, I should say, on some of those challenging questions that they might ask that'll throw me kind of off my game um, in order to, to, you know, be better at articulating what those answers would be. And so for, for like a group, you know, cause this kind of seems like it might be, you know, just kind of a smaller group and, you know, they, they don't want to see you succeed. I would meet with them individually, right? Be very transparent, be very opening and just let them know, hey, you know, I, from your questions or from the way that you react, from your facial expressions, whatever the case may be, I see that, you know, you always have something to say, right? And I may not be able to articulate it, you know, the best in the best manner, um, but, but you can kind of think through, you know, what that conversation should be, but, but have that conversation with them, right? Because, you know, others may pick up on, on that attitude, on those behaviors, and then you have kind of like that herd mentality and, and you don't want that. You want people that are in your favor, that are in your corner, and, and, you know, be able to, to really, you know, just get at the heart of the issue because maybe it's, it's minor in the whole scheme of things and just kind of sitting down one-on-one -on -one to talk about them, you'll re resolve whatever that, that conflict is, you know, and maybe it's, I mean, maybe it's truly something minor in the whole scheme of things that can be resolved just with that one-on-one -on -one meeting. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. That's a really good perspective. And, you know, as, as you were talking, I was reflecting and, and what I always tell myself is 99.99% .99 of the time, people come to work to do the right thing. And if it's not coming across that way, can we look at the process, the systems, the resources, what else is going on? Um, the other thing that I'll try to remember is assume good intent. So like you said, it's important to have that conversation to come in with an open mind and see if you can get to the bottom of it and resolve it in a way that works for everyone. Excellent, so I'm gonna move on. So we've got a bunch more great questions. The next one is, how have you juggled the increasing roles of responsibility in a manufacturing setting while trying to have a work-life balance with your children? Um, so this is from a woman who was previously a production manager of a 24-7 facility with a newborn at home during the peak of COVID. And, and no surprise, she found that extremely difficult. Yeah, I can, I can try to jump in here. It's certainly been uh, a long time since I've had a newborn. And I certainly uh, was not in my present role at that time. But I, I feel like I can can answer a little bit from, you know, the pandemic year that we've had here at Gojo. And yes, we are a 24-7 um, operation as well. 
but prior to that, you know, we were 24 five going into the pandemic and then we, you know, we had to scale up. Um, so I think one of those things is setting boundaries. Uh, sounds like we're in a, a similar role uh, of production manager, production director. Um, so, you know, I just, I turn my, my um, notifications off after 7 p.m. and I leave them off until 7 a.m. Uh, my, my team all knows if you need to reach me, you can call me, you know, between <laughs> seven at night and seven in the morning. But I think setting boundaries with your peers, uh, with your boss, if with anybody, you know, your direct reports that might be contacting you, it's some of those things. And, you know, if you need help at certain times, see if you can't get that help, you know, um, whether that's an assistant, whether there are certain projects that you can peel off a little bit and say, hey, you know, we've, we've got a lot going on right now. This is something that, you know, you brought up previously. And, you know, I think you can absolutely take the lead on this and do a great job. Delegate more. Uh, don't be afraid to do that. You know, you're, you're only developing those people so they'll be prepared for your role in the future so that you can move on easily when you're ready to do that. So I would absolutely say to set boundaries, delegate as much as you possibly can, and just, you know, do that for yourself. And, and same thing on those weekends. I turn those notifications off on the weekends. Yes, the VP sends me stuff all weekend long. Greg, I, I don't work until, <laughs> you know, 7 a.m. on Monday morning. So if you need me in an emergency, please call me. But uh, otherwise, I'm not going to respond to emails or you know text messages or whatever outside those those core business hours. Yeah, Donna, you know when you uh, was walking through that, it made me think about being eight months pregnant in New Jersey as a project engineer, just walking around in the summer, oh, <laughs> you <boy>. know, <laughs> look, looking at some projects, and and you know one of my projects was actually replacing a roof. So, so talk about one of the hottest places that you can be, right? And, and so, you know, you had to, to kind of set those boundaries. And, and I spoke to the crew about, hey, I just have to, I have to take a break, right? I have to sit down, you know, have this additional weight on me. And, and it's, it's really, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree, you know, setting boundaries and, and being honest with your team and, and divvying up those, those duties, right? And, and just letting them know if you're not available, Donna, between you know, 5 p.m. And, and the next day, you know, who is available, right? And, and can they contact them if they need an immediate answer? And so you know, that's, that's important to, to have someone to connect with uh, you know, in those times that, that you're not available. Thank you both. I, you know, I, what I heard as I was reflecting on what you were saying is it's really a, a two-pronged approach, right? You're advocating for yourself and the boundaries that you need to set. And then you're also empowering those that you work with to make good decisions and to serve themselves when they can, right? And, and to delegate effectively throughout. So excellent. All right. Here's another fun one. How do you gain trust from the older generation men who have an old school mentality of women in leadership and manufacturing? Seems like the young, younger generation is a lot more open-minded, but some employees that have been here 30 plus years are a little bit harder to reach. Yeah, I can tell you on that. Um, you know, I've certainly had that experience myself uh, multiple times. And I think some of those guys you're never going to reach. So, you know, if you get to the point where you've got one of those that you absolutely know you're never going to reach, then you know what? Let them be, let them think what they want to think. You go ahead, um, you be the high performer that you are, um, allow your performance uh, and your behaviors to speak for the professional that you are. Um, if you possibly can make friends with those guys. I, I had um, a gentleman once upon a time who was quite the grouch, you know, and he, um, I was just overly sickeningly sweet every time I dealt with him. And I mean, it, it, everybody else saw it, you know, and it was, oh, he's still grumping, grumping, grumping about whatever it is. And um, one day, you know, I, I had to do it and it was in front of several people again. And finally, he, he just lost it. He started laughing. He was like, you know, he just couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't be mean anymore because it, you know, had just gotten to that point. Um, but I, I think that, you know, we can't change anyone else. Uh, we can only change um, our 
perception of, you know, who we are, I guess, with that person, you just, I, I don't think you are going to change them. Sometimes, you know, they can see by your performance or your attitude or your behavior, what you bring to the table over time, but you just have to let it go. Just you know, just let it go and, and don't worry about what their concerns are. You know, you, you know what you bring to the table. And I think that speaks for itself. And if it doesn't, it, you're not going to change them, unfortunately. They just are who they are. Yeah, that's a great perspective, Donna. And I think it's like, um, if you think about a change, you've got a curve of people that are really early adopters and they're, they're chomping at the bit, ready to go. You've got the majority and then we get to the end where it's the laggards. And if somebody's really on that laggard end, I think exactly what you said, Donna, just remember that the only behavior you can change is your own. And if it's something where you feel their behavior is causing a performance problem, then it's time to get real crystal clear and concrete. What are the behaviors you're seeing? What are the impacts they're having? What's the plan to resolve? But if it's just something that you don't enjoy dealing with, exactly what you said, you got to let it go. Get that thick skin. Excellent. So this is a nice question. Um, have either of you gotten involved in or benefited from other industry organizations beyond WIM? Any recommendations for our crowd today? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think of all the organizations I'm involved with. Um, you know, there's some supply chain organizations uh, to, to get involved with. Um, you know, I'm connected through uh, the DuPont uh, company to different um, diversity events such as the Society of Women Engineers or the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, I'm even a part of Manufacturing Works. I saw someone on the line uh, for Manufacturing Works. And, and so with those different organizations, um, you know, the opportunity is really uh, based on what other people in the industry are doing. I know I went to, to one WIM event two years ago and someone talked about, you know, there being a website where you can go up there and see, you know, what you can recycle, right? And I saw that as a great opportunity to uh, look at sustainability for some of our byproducts at our plant and, and, you know, start that conversation around recycling and sustainability. And, and so there are a lot of opportunities, maybe not at the first meeting, maybe even not at the second meeting, but there are some, some neat opportunities by joining some industry organizations to, to help leverage um, you know, the learnings from, from those groups and, and that'll help you in your career or that can help you know, the company that you're working for. Because in some aspects, even though I can't you know, technically use uh, some of the information that I've learned, I'm able to, to share it with someone else. Um, another uh, prime example was I was on a, a, a committee call and, um, and they talked about uh, NASA and here in Ohio and in, in the Cleveland area. And so even though I'm not uh, really uh, too much connected with new applications, right? Cause I'm on the production side, you know, I was able to share that contact with uh, our new product development engineers and that organization so that they can capitalize off of the information that I've learned. Great, thank you. And Donna, I'm betting you've got quite a few as well. Yeah, I think um, one of the ones that I did not hear uh, Jonna call out was the uh, SHRM, Society for Human Resources Management. That's also a great place to network. You know, here at the facility that I'm at, we have 1,200 employees and about 600 of those are here in the production department. So we, there's a great deal of things that, you know, we support our employees with, whether it's culture, whether it's labor laws, um, you know, how do you deal with uh, difficult people? How do you deal with conflict? How do you motivate people? Well, you don't, you know, people motivate themselves. It's just a matter of finding out what that is that, you know, that person is interested in. So that, that has been a huge uh, resource for me as well. And just any of the community things, um, you know, I, here in Cuyahoga Falls, they, they have a little uh, community um, organization that 
is also very involved with Gojo as well. So any of those things I think are, are very helpful, but like Sherm has been particularly helpful for me over the years as well as Wim. Thank you both. Those are great recommendations. And, and I will say if you do a Google search, you will definitely find results, not only for other national or international organizations, but also regional ones. Um, some of the others that came to mind, depending on what sector of manufacturing you're in are things like the Industrial Fasteners Institute, uh, the Precision Metal Forming Association, the National Tooling and Machining Association. Um, you've got NAM, the National uh, Association for Manufacturers. You've got SHRM, as Donna mentioned, there's ATD, which is the Association for Talent Development. Um, you've got a lot of like workforce development consortiums. I know Medina County has a really active one. If you reach out to your Chamber of Commerce, you're going to get some great information. Um, and then for me personally, I, I try to do volunteering as well. And I always try to do a shout out for a couple of my favorites. So those include ones like College Now Greater Cleveland. Um, you've got YOU Youth Opportunities Unlimited. Um, you've got big brothers, big sisters. There are really so many ways to get involved and, and you're gonna meet people inside and outside of manufacturing and make connections that may bear surprising fruit in the future. So thank you both for that. Uh, oh, this is, I'm interested to hear answers to this one. So did you suffer from imposter syndrome as you moved into some of your new roles? And if so, how do you rise above that? Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm a big collaborator. Um, you know, even though, you know, I might have the answer and, you know, I feel that, that I, I'm very um, headstrong around, you know, what the path forward should be, you know, I still involve uh, the team. Um, I moved around, this, you know, I kind of lost count, but, you know, as Stacy uh, pointed out, there's a, you know, a bunch of facilities behind me um, of, of uh, opportunities and jobs that I've had, you know, all over kind of the US. And so I, I just really try to, to build a team of people and I'm very honest around not knowing the answer to a question. So I don't, I don't let imposter syndrome consume me um, because, you know, I know at some point I'll find someone with the, the answer and, um, you know, put all of the information together in order to, to solve that, that particular issue. Um, and, and I love, you know, the collaboration aspect, because even though you might have a good answer, you might not have the best answer. And, and so you need to, to, you know, talk to different people, get different perspectives, and then understand, you know, how to resolve that issue once you have, you know, all of that information um, to, to really filter through. Great. Thank you. And Donna, did you have something to add to that one? Sure, absolutely. Um, this is definitely something that I experienced more early on uh, than I do now. Um, I remember very well uh, at a time at, at Longaber when I was uh, sitting at the table with other department managers, people who had been department managers for years, who had been those managers from the time that you know I came in as a frontline worker for the very first day on the job. Uh, I went to Longaberger right out of high school. So I, I remember saying to someone, wow, you know, um, I don't, I don't feel like I belong at this table. And she said to me, Donna, look around that table. Um, who do you think does belong there? And she's like, look at the education level of all the people around you. Look at their background, their experiences. They may have been in the role longer than you have. You're the only one at that table that has any college whatsoever. You know, and she really described me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, I kind of get that. I felt the same thing when I left Longaberger and I went to making water softener. So how can I do this? I know everything about making a basket, but I don't know anything about making a water softener. You know, how can I help these people? Um, and I very quickly learned that, like you said, it doesn't matter what the product is. Um, and even today, you know, I, I'll look around and go, wow, this is a huge organization, you know, um, how am I qualified to do this? Yeah, I've got, you know, a little bachelor's degree in this or whatever, and I, I've got so many years of experience. But John is very right in that being humble um, really does help with that. You know, I'm not here in this role because I'm supposed to know everything. I'm here in this role to remove obstacles so everyone else can do their job. 
And if I think of it like that, I'm just here to remove the obstacles uh, for everyone else to bring what they bring to the table as individual contributors. Uh, I'm here to build the team and those things, you know, I've learned to do over the years. So yeah, I, I've certainly experienced it over the years more early on. I still experience it at times, but as long as you, you do the, the collaborating and you, you remain humble, people don't expect you to have all the answers and they, they do expect they, they want for you to reach out to them and say, wow, you know, what would you do? You know, if you were blah, blah, blah. Um, people are such a much stronger team if they're all contributing as opposed to me saying, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. No, it's this is what we need to accomplish. How might we do that? Yeah, Great. And, and Donna actually sparked, you know, a, another thought. Um, you know, build your competency also in, you know, a relevant area as well. Um, you know, uh, Donna, when you were talking, it, it made me think of early on in my career um, with DuPont, you know, the number one thing was that, that every employee was safe. And, and so they conducted, you know, safety audits at, at different plants. And so what I decided to do was volunteer to be a process safety management auditor and go from plant to plant, right? Just not only learning, you know, the different safety cultures, but also learning about, you know, the OSHA standards and, you know, how are plants running and maintaining their safety record and building up that skill set early on because, you know, I, I knew at some point in the future I would need to, to rely on, on those learnings. And so, you know, maybe you kind of pick an area where, you know, you can, you can use, right, in, in the future at some point based on, you know, the company's philosophy, based on the values that that company has, you know, maybe even based on, you know, even the technology uh, that, that, that that company has. You know, Donna, I'm great point around basket weaving and then water softening systems, right? You know, there's some leverageable things in there, right? I don't, I don't know off the top of my head right now, but, but from a system standpoint, yeah. you know, there's some things that, that you can leverage right around, you know, just processes and, and just knowing that, you know, people, then you'll be the go-to person, right? And, and you won't have the imposter syndrome. Great, thank you both so much. And we've got a question, a little bit different take on one we had earlier. What do you wish that others would have shown you or shared with you to make your initial years in manufacturing a little bit smoother path? Ooh, we've got a stumper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so for me, um, I think I'm trying to, to really kind of broaden my horizon, um, you know, kind of use manufacturing uh, because I know that area, I've been in that area for a long time. Um, you know, I, I just want to broaden my horizon. I want to learn something different. And at this point, I'm, I'm honestly being pigeonholed into manufacturing, right? You know, I want to, I want to step into sales and marketing and and you know, some of the managers are saying, well, Johnny, you've never been in sales and marketing. Well, that's the opportunity, you guys, you know? And so um, I wish early on, I would have stepped into kind of different uh, functions to get a more broader view and to appreciate, well, I appreciate manufacturing. I, you know, that's, that's where my heart is, but you know, you kind of appreciate it even more, right? When, you know, you're sitting across the table from, from a customer from a different perspective. I sit across from the customer to do a tour at this point, but, you know, to sit across the table, negotiate pricing, you know, things like that. I, I wish I would have gotten exposed to, you know, those functions early on so that I could come back to, to manufacturing with kind of that world view of, of you know, of, of just the company in general, right? So, I, you know, I mean, I know that's probably, a, you know, kind of a different perspective on that question, but I think it, it, you'll appreciate manufacturing more by working kind of in those other uh, functions. I think that's a great answer. And Donna, did you have something to share on that one? Um, I, I just kind of wanted to piggyback 
on, on what Jana said, and, and she is absolutely correct. You can very quickly get pigeonholed in manufacturing. Earlier, I talked about all the different areas that are available to, um, to work in manufacturing, but you can, you, if you get really good at something, you can very quickly get pigeonholed into that area. Um, so, so definitely watch out for that. Uh, make sure that what you're doing is what you're really excited about and what you wanna do long-term if you're gonna allow that to happen uh, to yourself. You know, you, you need to, if you possibly can in those early years, you know, don't spend all your time in production just because that's where you started. Uh, get into the sales side, you know, get into logistics, um, get into human resources or finance. Uh, if, if you want a really well-rounded career where, where you don't get um, stuff like that in just one area. The other piece that um, I wanted to throw in there was I wish someone would have told me in the beginning not to avoid difficult conversations or uh, challenging individuals. Uh, get out there, and, and I think John spoke to this early on, talk to them. You know, I, I approach those situations differently if it's a peer, you know, that may be throwing out those difficult um, questions during, uh, you know, a presentation or a meeting, or if it's a direct report, you know, if it's a frontline worker, I handle them differently, but I don't, I don't not handle them. You know, if I can, if I can find out, you know, what, what is at the root of why that person, you know, is, is challenging me on whatever that is, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can work through that. Sometimes once you talk through something, you'll find out that maybe you have the same opinion, you just have a different approach. Um, you know, with frontline workers, I try to get uh, those vocal people involved in, um, you know, like a focus group or a special project or something where they can feel like they're contributing and they'll learn and they'll develop and maybe eventually, um, you know, they'll see more than one side of a situation. Oh, now I understand why you were doing it that way or this way. Uh, so don't avoid those situations. They're, they are difficult. Nobody wants to do it. But the longer you let it go, the more, you know, anxiety that you build up. And it's just, it's better for everybody if you just approach them right out of the gate, you know, find a way to do that uh, so that you, you don't get into that situation. Thank you both. Those are great answers. And, and I, I can't second that enough. Um, I mentor students at Ohio State and Michigan State. And one of the questions they always ask is, what's the most critical skill on a one to 10 scale? And I say, communication, it's an 11. You have to have communication. So thank you both. All right, this is a nice one. We haven't gotten this one yet. What is the best way to support your fellow female colleagues when you aren't in a position of power? Uh, you know, so I would say through um, just, just encouragement, uh, I made it a point to, and then actually I had a, a lesson at the University of Delaware to jot down um, different buckets of, of connections. And one bucket of connections that, that I had a list of names for, you had to come up with like 50 names. And so one bucket was around um, just the employees, young employees within the company that I, I needed to connect back with. When I was the, the field engineering program lead of the rotational program, you know, I would have regular checkpoints with, with the young engineers uh, in the company uh, that I hired. And, you know, I kind of went away from that in the role that I have now. So I made that, that list connected with a couple of, of colleagues. Um, the ultimate goal um, with, when I was in that role was to um, bring in a diverse slate of candidates. So I had, you know, so 50% of the engineers that I brought into the company were women. And so I reconnected with all of them and they all had kind of different challenges that they were faced with. And so we walked through kind of some of those challenges that, that they were going through. And I gave them tips and, and tricks on how to resolve some of those issues. And so, you know, I made it a point to um, once a quarter to continue to connect with those women, see how they're doing. Um, also ask them about those challenges that they were faced with, you know, what did they end up uh, executing in order to resolve some of those situations and, and
other challenges that, that they're faced with. So, you know, for me, that's a way that, that I can encourage uh, women within the corporation and, and help them throughout, you know, their, their assignments, uh, throughout their time at, at DuPont. And, you know, I also even encourage them, even if they were to leave the company, that they can still connect with me, you know, whenever necessary, if, if they needed to. Great, thank you so much. We've got one final question that I think is really important. So I'd like to shift to that one. How did you know it was time to move on to the next challenge? For me, I feel like it's when I'm kind of getting bored. I feel like I've mastered whatever um, that role is. Uh, and it's like, wow, I just, I don't know. I mean, we can always improve on whatever that is, but it's, it, it's definitely for me when I'm, I start feeling itchy and it's like, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've done everything, you know, I, in my opinion, I've, I've mastered this particular role, or I want more responsibility. I want to have more influence over a larger part of the organization. Um, so I think for me, that's it. And I'll, I'll let Jonna jump in there because I know we don't have a lot of time left. Yeah, for, for me, and I'll combine this, but I saw the question around moving from supervisor to plant manager. Uh, the way that, that I got into my role is, um, it's, it's a, I don't know if it's a funny story, but, you know, I, I try to connect, you know, like I said earlier, um, with those roles, with those people that I've interacted with in, in the past. And so I was the operations manager for, for Valley View. And then I left, you know, to go to Wilmington and, and, you know, take on some other roles in West Virginia. But I always kept my ear out for, you know, how the plant was doing, you know, how that organization was doing. And, you know, Valley View was, was really in a situation at the time where we were several millions of dollars behind and, and the customer really needed their, their products. So I was in Wilmington at the time and, and I asked my boss and I said, you know, I really want to go back and help. I, I need to help the plant. You know, they're not in a, a great position and I think I can be the one to turn it around. And so he said, well, talk to the business president. And, and see, you know, how you fare, you know, with that conversation, and then we'll take it from there. So I went into to that meeting, right? I didn't expect to meet with the business president, right, of, of all people. And, and, you know, I kind of just, you know, sold why I needed to go back, right? And, and the way and the capacity I need to go back, it was a plant manager position. That's where I'll have the capability and, and the know-how, I can rally the team together and we can, can really start executing whatever it is that needed to be done in order for us to put us in a better position in, uh, in our customers' eyes. And so, you know, it was kind of, I, I think of that moment as, as like a coach player moment, right? You know, hey coach, put me in, I can do it. You know, I can get us to the Super Bowl or, or you know, wherever it is we need to be. And, and actually he put me in, right? He said, Jonna, you know, I have faith in you, go ahead, do it. And, and you know, we were able to, to get out the hole. Um, and, and, you know, right now we're, we're all greens across the board with all of our customers. And, you know, now, you know, like Donna, I'm kind of bored, so I'm ready for my next role <laughs> because, you know, I, 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 I did what I needed to, to do. But, you know, sometimes you just have to, to just get in front of leadership and just build the confidence um, in them, you know, and, and just let them know that, hey, you know, I can knock it out the park, just give me a chance, right? Just give me a chance. Great, thank you both so much. This was, looks like I muted myself accidentally, gotta love technology. So thank you both, this was a great conversation. I think you both were so transparent and humble and really shared some great experiences. I know I had quite a few aha moments and I hope the same was true for our attendees. We do encourage you to chat in. If you enjoyed today's session, if you'd recommend these types of events in the future, uh, Jamie and the rest of the, the board and I always wanna hear your feedback and make sure we're providing impactful experiences for you. And I also put in a link to our website to check out our upcoming events. So with that big round of applause, thank you so much, yeah. Donna and Jana. Take care everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, take care.